Jitter analysis is a critical component in characterizing high-speed digital designs. Does your oscilloscope provide the breadth of jitter measurements you need to perform that characterization? With the faster edge speeds and shrinking data valid windows in today's high-speed digital designs, insight into the causes of signal jitter is critical in ensuring the reliability of your design. To gain fast and accurate insight into your signal, you need advanced decomposition, analysis, and views of jitter. When evaluating an oscilloscope, you should be looking for jitter capabilities like histograms and trend plots, advanced level clock and data measurements such as time interval error and unit interval measurements, expert level analysis with complete jitter separation in timing and noise, and phase noise measurements on clock signals, which you'll only find on Keysight oscilloscopes. In this video, you'll learn about some of the different solutions to meet these requirements, such as various histograms, bathtub plots, spectrum graphs, and threshold measurements. The jitter setup process and results can often seem daunting. This breakdown will help you better understand what various graphs and charts are telling you about the jitter in your system. If you're just starting to learn about jitter, check out my video, How to Measure Jitter with an Oscilloscope. In that video, I walk through the basics of jitter, like what it is, what time interval error is, or TIE, the difference between random jitter and deterministic jitter, how to read histograms, measurements, and trend plots, how to use and analyze the spectrum view, and I talk about methods for clock recovery as well. You'll notice that video uses the 6000X series oscilloscope, but today we'll be working with the Infinium S-Series oscilloscope. While concepts learned on the 6000X still hold true for this oscilloscope, the setup is very different. The Infinium EasyJIT Complete application found on the S-Series provides you with significantly more insight into the types of jitter affecting your signal. With that, the setup is a bit more complex, but the setup wizards help make that a lot easier. Wizards seem to be underused, but they can be extremely helpful in setting up complex analysis, especially if you don't know exactly what your settings should be. You can use the setup wizards for all levels of jitter and phase noise measurements. These provide detailed help guides to walk you through every setup option. So once you're done setting up with the wizard, you're ready to analyze. The analysis charts provide detailed information needed to properly separate the jitter of your design. Let's quickly remind ourselves of the various types of jitter there are. After all, the reason we're performing this analysis is to determine what types of jitter exist in our signal and how much each type is affecting it. I highly recommend you take a photo or screenshot of this chart to reference throughout the rest of the video. So we want to understand what's data correlated versus data uncorrelated. What is caused by your design versus what's out of our control. Total jitter, or TJ, encompasses all jitter in the signal. Deterministic jitter, DJ, is any data-dependent jitter, DDJ. This is caused by your design and can be seen as inner symbol interference, or ISI, or duty cycle distortion, DCD. ISI is caused by things like imperfections in the transmission path or imperfections in matching the rise and fall times of transmitters. DJ also consists of periodic jitter, or PJ, which calls for different troubleshooting techniques than DDJ does. PJ could be caused by things like coupling from a switching power supply or coupling from another clock source in the system. The other component of TJ is random jitter, or RJ. RJ is caused by random noise, which can't be designed out, but just designed around. You have to understand what RJ is present so that you know what to multiply by to achieve the specified bit error rate. So let's take a look at a few of the charts available and how they can help you. And note that jitter measurements are actually made on all cycles of the waveform, including those not shown on the display window. The RJPJ histogram measures the TIE function with the DDJ removed. It shows the RJ cross-correlated with the PJ. A Gaussian-shaped RJPJ histogram would indicate that there's negligible PJ in the source waveform. To extract the RJ, there are two different possible methods, spectral and tail fit. 
The spectral method computes the RJ by integrating the noise floor of the RJ-PJ spectrum. There are two different options for defining that noise floor, wide or narrow. In the jitter spectrum, PJ components are seen as tall, narrow spikes. We want to remove these PJ components so that we're left with only the RJ. In many cases, it's easy to define these spikes. However, there are measurements that have shorter, wider peaks, such as 1 over F noise or pink noise. Pink noise has a large value near DC and slowly tapers off. The wide, narrow setting allows you to decide whether a broad peak like that should be considered periodic or part of the noise floor, the random jitter. In wide mode, the pink noise will be seen as PJ, whereas in the narrow mode, it will be seen as RJ. The other method of RJ extraction is called tail fit. Tail fit is used for aperiodic, bounded, uncorrelated jitter, such as crosstalk. Often this can be seen as RJ, when in fact it's very different and it's affecting your signal. The algorithm works by fitting a Gaussian function to the tails of the RJ-PJ histogram. In general, the tail fit method requires more data to converge than the spectral method. So we recommend using the spectral method unless you expect crosstalk or other aperiodic, bounded, uncorrelated jitter. In the case that you're not sure which method to use, you can look at the tail fit spectral bathtub plot to determine which method works best. Next, you can find the DDJ histogram. This is calculated directly from the DDJ versus bit function, which you'll learn about shortly. This histogram provides a graphical representation of the ISI and DCD within the total measured jitter. And now the TJ histogram is similar to the histogram of the TIE function you saw in my last video. The Infinium EasyJIT Complete software calculates the TJ histogram by cross-correlating the DDJ histogram with the RJPJ histogram. This technique reduces the variance in the histogram function compared to a histogram produced directly from the TIE function. So it gives you a much more accurate view of the overall TJ in your signal. I mentioned the DDJ versus bit function. This graph displays the average time error associated with each bit of the source's waveform repeating bit pattern. A positive value of DDJ indicates that the transitions preceding those bits arrive later than they should. This graph shows which patterns and which bits within a pattern are most likely to cause transmission errors. Since the DDJ versus bit function is used to analyze the waveform's repeating bit pattern, it naturally is only used with pattern waveforms. Alternatively, if you're analyzing an arbitrary waveform, you can utilize the ISI filter graph. This indicates which transitions relative to a specific bit position add or subtract delay in the total DDJ. The bit error rate bathtub plot, or BER bathtub, plots the width of the data valid window of a signal on the horizontal axis versus the bit error rate on the vertical axis. The two sides of a bathtub plot each consist of a measured section and an extrapolated section. The top section, which is the high bit error rate, is calculated directly from the measured TJ time interval error. The lower section, which consists of low bit error rates, is calculated by extrapolation, either with the spectral method or the tail fit method. The bathtub plot is really useful in visualizing how the desired BER affects the data valid window, or alternatively, what BER can be expected from a desired data valid window. And note that the EasyJIT Complete application provides both timing jitter separation and vertical noise separation. You'll find similar charts for vertical noise separation. Lastly, if you're analyzing clock jitter, another critical measurement to make is phase noise. Dedicated phase noise measurements are only available on Keysight Infinium oscilloscopes. Phase noise is related to clock TIE and generally it's used to measure change in an oscillator's frequency, either in the long term or short term. When you look at the spectrum of an imperfect clock or oscillator, there will be energy radiated slightly off the nominal clock frequency or the carrier, called sidebands. Phase noise is generally measured as a ratio of the spectral power in the carrier versus the phase noise in the sidebands, normalized to one hertz of bandwidth. The results are presented in a log frequency plot, where the amplitude units are dBc per hertz. That is, decibels relative to the carrier power 
normalized to one hertz of bandwidth. The x-axis is the frequency offset from the carrier frequency. Resulting spurs can be normalized, omitted, or be represented separately to better show their energy levels. These various graphs and measurements that you'll find in the Infinium EasyJIT Complete application help you to fully characterize the jitter in your signal. In order to eliminate as much jitter as possible, you have to be able to indicate the specific types of jitter that are present in your signal and what's causing them. Be sure that your oscilloscope has the variety of jitter analysis capabilities needed to design the best high-speed digital devices. Look for functions like histograms for each type of jitter, trend plots, clock and data measurements like time interval error and unit interval measurements, complete jitter separation in timing and noise, and phase noise measurements. In order to test the true jitter in your signal, you have to be sure your oscilloscope has both very low noise and high signal integrity. There are a few key specifications you should consider to ensure your oscilloscope gives you the highest signal integrity and best measurement accuracy. Learn about those specifications and some of the common misconceptions around signal integrity in the ebook how to determine oscilloscope signal integrity. Thanks for joining today. Be sure to put any questions in the comments below and stay up to date on scope tips and tricks by subscribing to our YouTube channel and following us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter.